everyone and welcome to chapter 8. This is transport in mammals. In this chapter, there are three main parts. Number one is the circulatory system, which includes the vessels or the fluids and the cells. Part two is about transport of oxygen and carbon dioxide. And this is basically how oxygen reaches our cells and how carbon dioxide gets out of them to the environment. And part three, there is the heart. We need to know the structure, the cardiac cycle, and how it's being controlled and all the nervous pathways involved. So yeah, it's a lot. It's quite a big chapter, but let's start one step at a time. Let's start with blood vessels today. But hey, before we go into blood vessels, let's talk a little bit about what the circulatory system is. What is the circulatory system? So the circulatory system is a system that involves blood vessels, blood, lymph, and the heart. It's also called the cardiovascular system. Cardio usually refers to the heart. Vascular refers to all the vessels, so cardiovascular system. The name kind of makes sense. Anyways, this is important system because, as you know, you should already know this, that is needed for transport of nutrients and oxygens around the body. It's also for disposal of waste materials. For example, carbon dioxide. Yes, carbon dioxide is a waste material. Um, and urea. So yeah, it's really important. Also, it's for the transport of hormones and to circulate white blood cells and red blood cells in the body. And honestly, it also transports a lot more things than these, but these are the main ones. Now, when we talk about the human circulatory system, we often refer to it as a closed double circulatory system. Uh, what do we mean by closed double? Let's define them word by word. What does close mean? Close means that the blood is contained in the blood vessels. The red blood cells are inside the blood vessels, always. It's always found in the heart, arteries, veins, or capillaries. What do we mean by double? Double just refers to the fact that blood passes through the heart twice in one complete circuit. What do we mean by one circuit? One circuit is two circulations, which makes one full round. We can see here that there are two circulations. One is a pulmonary circulation, where the deoxygenated blood leaves the right side of the heart, goes to the lungs to be oxygenated, and then comes back to the heart. This is the pulmonary circulation. The next circulation is called the systemic circulation. And you can see here how the oxygenated blood leaves the heart, goes to the rest of the body, and then deoxygenated blood is transported back to the heart. So this is a circulation through other parts of the body and heart except the lungs. These two circulations make up one complete circuit. And as you can see, uh, the blood does pass through the heart twice. Okay this here right here and right here and therefore we are deemed to have a double circulatory system now what are the other types of circulatory system now the opposite to closed circulatory systems are open ones so what do open ones mean right open means that the blood does not need to be in the vessels and closed in the vessels we can see here uh, for insects especially they have a special kind of blood called hemolymph, another word for blood, and how it actually surrounds the organs. These vessels are open, they are not connected to another vessel. Okay, and yeah, it's allowed to mix around with the organs. So that's an open circulatory system. Now, this is a closed circulatory system, much like ours. You can see the blood is enclosed in the vessels. Uh, however, this is a single closed circulatory system because the blood only passes through the heart once so yeah uh, this is not actually an essential part of the syllabus i just wanted you to see you know how close double circulatory system look different from these ones that we are looking at right here now that we are done with defining what circulatory systems are we can look at blood vessels there are mainly three types of blood vessels we need to talk about. Number one, arteries. Arteries carry blood away from the heart, and most of them carry oxygen the blood from the heart to the tissues, well, except for the pulmonary artery. Remember the word pulmonary? Again, tells you that it's related to the lungs. 
So pulmonary artery would transport deoxygenated blood from the heart to the lungs to be oxygenated. So that's arteries. Most of them carry oxygenated blood. The smaller versions of that are called arterioles, which then send the blood into capillaries. Capillaries are basically exchange vessels. They are smaller, very thin. They bring blood close to tissues. And this is where, you know, oxygen is unloaded and carbon dioxide is taken on by those red blood cells. And um, this deoxygenated blood would be then sent to the veins. So the veins, this carry blood towards the heart, back to the heart. Usually it carries deoxygenated blood. And of course, there is one exception to that. That exception is the pulmonary vein, which transports oxygenated blood from the lungs back to the heart. But any vein other than that vein would carry deoxygenated blood. So yes, these are the three main blood vessels in general, but there's actually a lot of detail to its structure, and we are going to look at each of them individually, starting from arteries. Arteries has a shorter distance from a heart, and therefore, you can expect blood to be traveling at the very high pressure in arteries. And therefore, the structure of arteries, you know, have a certain morphology. So it has a certain appearance. It has a certain structure to withstand that high pressure. It's usually a well-defined oval shape. It has a really thick wall, especially in comparison to its narrow lumen. It's always like a proportion, you know, like thick wall, narrow lumen. It also has a folded endothelium. You can see it right here. Um, I can zoom in a little bit. The endothelium here, you can see how it's crinkled on the inside. And generally speaking, you can kind of figure out three layers. The folded endothelium, it's called the tunica intima. The middle layer, where it kind of looks like, to me, layers of tissue paper. This is like, ring a bell like it's like layers and layers and layers of tissue paper well it's mostly smooth muscles which we will study later but this layer here is called the tunica media and right on the outside of that layer there is one more layer called tunica externa let's start with tunica intima what is making up this folded endothelium on the inside of arteries right all right on the inside Tunica intima kind of tells you that it's intima, right? So it's the most intimate, the most inside layer of the arteries. The tunica intima, or the endothelium layer, is made out of squamous epithelial cells. And these cells are flattened cells. They are quite smooth, and they are only one cell thick. This whole layer is only one cell thick. And therefore, it can barely be seen under the light microscope under low magnification. However, you can make make it out kind of uh, because it kind of looks like a, a thin black line. You know it's there. Anyways, there's a smooth surface and it faces the lumen. And that's it. That's all for tunica intima. It's just a layer of squamous epithelial cells. Now, what's very interesting would be tunica media. This is the thickest layer with three Cs. This has three components, collagen fibers, elastic fibers, and smooth muscle. Before we go into the roles of these three components, let's look at the tunica externa, which is basically the same components, except it does not have the smooth muscle layer, just collagen fibers and elastic fibers. So tunica media, thickest layer, collagen fibers, elastic fibers, and smooth muscle. Tunica externa, most external layer, only has collagen fibers and elastic fibers. But what does it do? What does it do? Number one, collagen fibers. Collagen fibers can withstand high pressure and prevent rupture of vessels. As we have learned in chapter two, I don't know if you remember, but in chapter two, we learn in specific how collagen molecules are formed and how it, you know, is arranged into fibers. And as we know from chapter 2, collagen fibers have high tensile strength, so you can expect it to withstand those high pressure uh, in the arteries, which is very close to the heart. Now, how about elastic fibers? How does it help 
withstand high pressure. To understand what elastic fibers do, I need you to imagine the heart beating. Right? It's not contracting all the time, it's contracting and relaxing and contracting and relaxing. And this contraction and relaxation of the heart actually results in what we call pulse of health flow. And uh, you might be more familiar with the term systolic pressure and diastolic pressure. And these are actually results of pulse of health flow. When the heart contracts, the blood is at a high pressure very high pressure and when the heart relaxes that blood pressure drops and that minimum blood pressure is called diastolic pressure so maximum systolic minimum diastolic pressure and we usually measure this on our left arm which is closest to our heart and at the same level of our heart to ensure a more accurate reading so yeah our our blood is not gracefully flowing through our arteries it's actually moving in pulse health flows periods of high pressure and low pressure alternatively so how do the elastic fibers actually work in order to smooth out the pulse health flow and how does it work to enable the arteries to withstand high pressure well elastic fibers are elastic right they can stretch and they can recoil so elastic fibers allows the vessels to stretch when there's high pressure, when the blood um, is coming out from the heart at high pressure, when the heart is contracting. When, but when the heart relaxes and the blood pressure drops, elastic fibers allow the vessel to recoil, the elastic fiber recoil, in order to give blood a small push in, push forward in order to increase the blood pressure by a little bit. Now, the repeated motion of stretching and recoiling throughout the elastic arteries would allow the pulsatile flow to be smoothed out. So you can see here in this graph that is not undulating pressure all the way, right? It, it's up and down, up and down, up and down, but that maximum and minimum points get smaller and smaller. And eventually, at the arterioles and capillaries, the blood flow does smooth out. It's not... Um, not all your blood is pulsating in that sense. So yeah, this helps maintain blood pressure, uh, does not allow the blood pressure to fluctuate too much all in your body, just in the beginning near the heart. So yeah, that's the function of elastic fibers. Remember, elastic fibers stretch and recoil. And when we talk about smooth muscles, which is our next thing, we don't use the word stretch and recoil. Smooth muscle also maintains blood pressure, but in contrast to elastic fibers, they contract and relax. So again, elastic fiber stretch and recoil, but smooth muscles contract and relax. And this changes the diameter of the arter arteries, and this keeps blood uh, moving forwards. When muscles relax, arterioles become wider, which is vasodilation, whereas when muscles contract, arterioles become more narrow in vessel constriction, and this reduces blood flow. You can see the differences between elastic fibers and smooth muscle because elastic fibers again stretch and recoil and what it does is to smooth out that pulse of flow and you don't really withstand that blood pressure. Smooth muscle on the other hand seems to aim to increase or decrease blood flow. It's a it's like a control mechanism. And this is usually this is why, this is why um, arteries further from the heart has less elastic fibers and more smooth muscles. So arteries nearer to the heart are called elastic arteries. Because, well, when you're nearer to the heart, the pulse of health flow there is much more apparent, and therefore elastic fibers are needed there, is closer to the heart. Again, they can stretch and recoil in order to withstand that high pressure. However, further from the heart, we have muscular arteries or arterioles, which can, then can act to contract and relax to control the volume of blood flow going to different tissues. 
um, different annual capillaries. And it also slows down the blood in order to prepare for gas exchange later on in the capillaries. Speaking of capillaries, let's talk about them in more detail. Capillaries are around 7 micrometer in diameter. Um, it's kind of really tiny compared to arteries in arterial. It's one cell thick and is made out of endothelial or squamous epithelial cells. And you can see here in this diagram how it's arranged. Now it's adapted for its function and it has a few traits. Number one, I just said it, it's one cell thick and this enables it to have a short diffusion distance for you know, nutrients or waste products. It has pores or gaps between those endothelial cells. You can see where these arrows are pointing. These are all gaps so that some smaller components of blood can pass through. For example, water, ions, glucose, etc. This also allows the formation of tissue fluid, which is something we're going to see next video. Number three, it also has a small lumen diameter for a reason. Bigger is not more effective, right? Smaller lumen diameter would enable blood to slow down even more and bring red blood cells quite close to body tissue. We can see how narrow this uh, capillary is because it can only about fit one or two red blood cells in its lumen. The blood pressure in capillaries are very much lower because it's quite far from the heart at this stage and also you know it's a very small lumen diameter and this is good because more effective diffusion could happen four it also has a very high surface area even one is very tiny there's a lot of them there is a network of capillaries which form a capillary bed which allows for more exchange and i guess it covers more ground than you would if it's just one big vessel so yeah, that's the capillaries. Now let's talk about veins. Now veins have a very low blood pressure, you know, compared to the artery because it's really far from the heart right now. It's much slower blood flow, but it also has three layers. You can see here in the micrograph that its appearance is quite different from artery. Yes, you do need to know how to distinguish them, by the way. So you yeah, take note. Um, you can see how it's a little bit irregular. It seems to have a more flattened oval shape. Not so nice and round like an artery. It's, it has a wider lumen and thinner uh, tunica media. And when we come to lumen and wall, again, it's always in comparison with itself. So it's a lumen to lumen diameter to wall ratio, you know. So the vein, you can see the lumen is actually quite wide in comparison to its wall. The tunica media, however, is quite thin in comparison to the artery as well. Uh, even though it has three layers as well, the tunica media, which is the middle layer, has less elastic tissue and less smooth muscle in comparison to artery. Again, why? Because, well, it has low blood pressure. Okay, You can also see that the endothelium is not as wavy. It doesn't appear like that. And therefore, you can safely look at it and determine it's definitely a vein just from the appearance. Now, there are some special features of veins in comparison to arteries. Number one is the presence of valves. Valves are there to prevent backflow of blood. It ensures blood flows towards the heart, not away from it. Now, when when uh, the blood flows in the opposite direction, the valves would close. And I think this is a beautiful diagram to figure it out. So if this, if the valves are facing this way, this direction would be allowed. But if the blood flows backwards, that valve would close. Now, number two is that it's surrounded by skeletal muscles. And skeletal muscles are the ones that pushes blood towards heart. When, when we're talking about arteries, the blood flow really depends on the heart pumping, right? But veins are so far away from the heart. So how does it get blood back to the heart? Well, skeletal muscle contraction. So when you move, it does push it back. And that's it for veins. Here are some light micrographs for veins, arteries, and capillaries. And you can see how the artery really looks like a bunch of tissue paper. You can see how the layers in there 
are caused by the smooth muscles. Pretty cool. Uh, you can see how wavy that inner in endothelial lining is compared to the veins. You are needed, it is required for you to be able to distinguish the artery and vein under the light microscope. Now we can see the, a picture of the capillary as well, uh, which is very small in comparison to the artery. And the red bits here, I think, the dark red bits, I think that those are the nucleus. And it, it does seem to show that the capillary is only one cell thick com in comparison to the artery and vein. So yeah, those this is how artery veins and capillary look like. Now let's look at some graphs when it comes to this flow of arteries to arterial to veins. Right, what is going on here? The first graph we're going to look at is lumen diameter. Now this is quite obvious. Lumen diameter, you know, arteries have a narrow lumen, thicker wall, okay, and veins tend to have a larger diameter. And capillaries very tiny, so it's like a U-shaped kind of graph. However, when we talk about surface area, you can see how it peaks at capillaries because even though capillaries have a very small lumen, the network of capillaries result in a very high surface area, which is efficient for gas exchange. Now, how about blood velocity? So how fast is blood flowing through the vessels? We can see here it's very high in the arteries and velocity in veins are much lower than arteries due to low blood pressure. It's faster in the arteries due to, well, the pumping of blood. Whereas in the veins, the movement of blood depends only on the contraction of skeletal muscles. Now, how about pressure? Now, obviously, we can see here that there is there is a undulating pressure in the artery area, and that's because it's close to the heart. The blood pressure pulsates in the artery due to the pumping of the heart. Elastic fibers, which is the feathers who stretch and recoil, these substances help smooth out pulse without flow. However, you can see the pressure dropping all the way to the veins. Pressure in veins are very, very, very low due to its distance from a heart pump. And the only way it's moving is because of the contraction of skeletal muscles. It's moving, but the pressure is very incredibly low. So yeah, these are the graphs you need to know when it comes to blood vessels. There's a little um, comparison table at the end. Maybe it would be useful. We can pause this video and look at it in order to have a little summary. But yeah, that's it for my video today. I hope you enjoyed and learned something. I'll see you next video. Bye-bye.